Mayflower is a worker placement auction tile laying city building game for two to six players. It's Ryan from Knights Around a Table. Let's find the fun. But before we do, I'm going to be talking about Keyflower as though you already know how to play. If you don't already know how to play, I made a how to play video for your edification. Please watch that first and then we can all be on the same page. Not fun. Setup is a bear. You got a gigantic pile of hexagonal cardboard tiles and they're all sorted into four different seasons. Spring, summer, winter, fall. You have to have all those separated, presumably in plastic baggies, which the game does supply. Shuffle them all up and then you have to have just a certain number depending on your player count. So you have to check the instruction booklet for that. You have to make sure that you separate one of the meeple colors out from the other meeple colors before you play. And just the result is that you've got a big empty box with no insert to speak of and everything jammed into all these plastic baggies, which I actually took to printing out office labels to label my baggies to remind me of how many different tiles in the different seasons go out depending on your player count. Yuck, that stinks. But don't worry, I'm going to address this in an upcoming episode of Bits Please. Bits Please! Not fun. The game hands you some winter tiles and you have to decide on a few to keep. And those tiles aren't going to come out until the end of the game. So you're a little bit like Babe Ruth kind of calling your shots and thinking like, okay, I have a tile that rewards me for, for having a bunch of different colors of meeples at the end of the game. So that'll inform my strategy. The interesting thing, by the way, though, is that at the end of the game, if you decide to put that tile out for auction, you may not be the one who wins it. And so you've been building all the way to this certain goal and somebody snipes it from you. That's kind of cool. But what I don't like about it is that if you're introducing this game to new players, they sit there with these new tiles. You have to explain what all of the icons mean and how the entire game is played before they can make that initial decision of what tile to keep. So, you know, that's not so great. I don't like games that require new players to make decisions based on information they don't have, can't possibly have, and are at a disadvantage making those decisions. I've seen it handled better in games like Raise Arcana, where the rule book says, okay, here are starting hands, deal these out to everybody. And then once you play one game and everybody's familiar, then next game, what you really want to do is draft, because that's how this game's supposed to be played. I think that Keyflower could use a little bit of an easing in mode for new players, especially if they're joining experienced players. Fun, the core of the game, that auction system. I have played board games with auction systems in them. I have been to real life auctions, but I ain't never seen an auction quite like the one in this game. Everyone's got meeples, fine. The meeples are your money, interesting. There are hexes out on the table that you wanna bid on so they can come and be part of your farm, cool. You bid on those hexes by placing your meeples on the edge of the hexagon that's closest to you, neat. In order to win the tile, you have to place more meeples than whoever's currently leading the bid on their edge of the tile. Okay. So far that all sounds like a standard auction game. But the neat thing about Keyflower is that the color of the meeple that you use to bid matters. If you bid on a tile with a blue meeple, that auction is locked to blue meeples on that tile for the rest of the auction round. And the game has three different colors of meeples, blue, yellow, and red. So that's essentially like an auction where you're dealing with three completely different currencies. If somebody bids ruples on this thing, you can't go ahead and bid lira. Add to that that there's a fourth currency. Depending on how the deal works out, you could have tiles that let you get green meeples. And what's cool about that is that if you're the only player with green meeples, as soon as you plunk one of those suckers down, you've locked that auction green. So that's your tile. Nobody can do anything about it unless they somehow get a green meeple themselves. So you're essentially like paying for the auction in Bitcoin. In addition, most of the tiles you're bidding for have a function in the center of the tile. Instead of bidding, you can place a meeple on the center of that tile. But again, if it's locked to a certain color or a certain currency, you either lock it to that currency by playing the first meeple there, or you have to abide by that locked currency by playing a meeple or more meeples that match that color. Huh. And then it starts to get really interesting. The meeples that you bid for a tile go away at the end of the auction round. Whether you win the tile or you don't, they're gone. The meeples played to the center of that tile go to the winner of the tile. So of course a power play is to use meeples to activate a tile and win the tile so that even though the meeples that you bid go away, the tile comes to you along with any meeples that are on it. So we're getting further and further away from what like a stock standard auction might look like in a board game. But wait, there's more. You can bid as many meeples as you want to around the edge in order to win the tile at auction. But as for activating a tile, well that's limited too. A tile can only hold six meeples in the center. 
So that means that if one meeple was used to activate it, the next person or you who activates it has to put two meeples on there, and the next person, again could be you, has to put three meeples on there, for a total of six. But if you want to make it really spicy, you don't put one meeple on there, you lead off by putting two meeples on there. Now the next person, again could be you, has to put three meeples on there, beating that last activation number in order to activate that tile. And if you absolutely positively must nuke the site from orbit, you lead off with three meeples on the tile. So nobody can place four because that would make it over six, that would put seven meeples on the tile. So you completely lock that tile off to your nefarious purposes. And again, if you win that tile, all those meeples come back to your village and you can use them again in the next round. And one more mechanic that makes the auction system really interesting. If you have meeples around the edge of a tile and somebody rolls in and outbids you, those meeples are freed up. You can pick them up as a unit and either use them to bid on another tile or use them to activate a tile, potentially sweetening the deal with meeples that you had hidden behind your privacy screen. Does that sound like any game that you've ever played before? There are a lot of board games out there and uh, trust me, I haven't played them all. But as for the games I have played, and especially the ones that I've played with an auction system in them, there's nothing that even comes close to how interesting that is. I suspect it's entirely unique, and it's interesting, and it's compelling, and it's challenging, and I really like it. Fun! There's this really compelling system that has you transporting different barrels of goods to your tiles on your farm. All the tiles that you win at auction come and build out your farm, and they're all double-sided. You can do stuff to them to upgrade them to a better side. But usually, the goods that you use to upgrade those tiles have to be on the tiles that you're upgrading. And how do you get them there? Well, you place meeples on special tiles that give you transport powers. If you use your meeples to activate tiles that give you resources, and those tiles are in your own little village, the resources appear on the tiles that you activated. But what's really interesting about Keyflower is that all the tiles in everybody's villages are fair game for anybody to play on. They all become wide open worker placement slots, notwithstanding the color lock and the number lock rules. If you use a meeple to activate a tile in somebody else's village that generates resources, those resources appear on your home tile in your village. So you've got different locations where resources can appear. If you want to upgrade your tiles, those are different locations where you want the resources to end up. So you have to activate these tiles in your village or in somebody else's village that give you transport powers to move those barrels around. It's a really neat puzzle, and it's difficult, and it scratches my brain in a really nice way. Not fun! Again, with my concern for new players, and I have tried to teach this game to a bunch of different new people, especially non-gamers, that transport system is really challenging to teach to people. I think part of the problem is that the icon for upgrading looks like a house, and it means a house, sort of, but it also is supposed to look like an arrow, like an up arrow upgrade, but then I think on the tiles when you're looking to the upgrade path it's actually pointing down, so it's like a, but that's a white arrow, is that the same thing? I don't know. And it's a little tough to get people's minds around the idea that you can place meeples on other people's farms and use their upgrade tiles to upgrade your stuff. Maybe a good analogy is that it's like an Amish barn raising and you're calling your neighbors over to help you flip your tiles over and make them better. I don't know, it's a nut that I haven't cracked and I, I just find it kind of tough to teach. Fun! There's a really neat risk reward thing going on when you actually do upgrade those tiles. As I mentioned, it's tough to get those resources onto the right tiles so that you can upgrade them. And once you do, you flip the tile and there's usually a much better action on the other side of the tile. However, it's not your turn anymore. It's one of your opponent's turns, and because all of your tiles in your village are open to everybody as worker placement spots, that means that all of the work that you put into upgrading that tile can be sniped by one of your opponents. They can come and put a meeple on that tile. So one of the things that you can do to defend against that is to put a meeple on the tile to lock it a certain color, because maybe you have a lot of meeples in that color, and then pay to move the goods and then flip that tile over so it's still locked your color because that meeple is still on it, and that means you can put more meeples on it and use the upgraded action. But it means that you kind of wasted a meeple on that tile using the less good benefit of that tile. Duh! The decisions are really, really interesting, and I'll be honest, a little bit agonizing. Not fun. Most of my concerns are for new players with this game. Keyflower is the kind of game where you can go round after round after round and not realize that you made horrible mistakes in the first round until like the third or fourth round, like the final one. Maybe you realize that you used way too many meeples off the first round to bid on things and then you're just meeple strapped for the rest of the game. 
Maybe you didn't understand how important it was to bid on turn order tiles so that you get a better pick of boats, which were fresh or meeple supply. Or maybe you didn't fully appreciate that that first round in spring is all about tiles that generate resources, and you didn't get any resource generating tiles for your own farm. It's the kind of thing that only one or two plays through the game can really teach you properly. So you have to be willing, if you're interested in playing this game, to go through at least one game, maybe two, in order to learn the ropes before you can really start enjoying and savoring the experience. And in a hobby where we're constantly distracted by the next shiny thing, it's hard to commit to playing a game more than once, isn't it? Not fun. If you don't like randomness, there is a little bit of that in this game. Everyone gets a randomly dealt number of meeples off the top of the game, and there are a few tiles that have you pulling a random meeples or random tool tiles out of a bag. So it's possible if you're a curse the dice kind of person that your whole strategy might be foiled by a bad draw from one of those games. Me, I don't mind a little randomness and I don't think it's to the degree where it gets in your way too, too badly in this game. Fun. It's important to keep the number and color of the meeples that you have secret. So the game supplies you with these little screens, but they took the extra step in making them really nice and thematic. They look like little tiny houses and each one is unique. It has little details on the inside of what the inside of your little farmhouse looks like and what the outside looks like, whether it's made of stone or wood and it's got a little thatch roofs. It's really adorable and endearing. Not fun. Well, the house screens are cool, but the engineering on them is a little bit <laughs> dodgy. They're meant to lock in the corners by these really literally paper thin chimneys that you stick down in slots to prevent them from opening. And they're kind of roly poly and a little bit tumbly and they could flip over accidentally. They feel a little bit flimsy and you can big bad wolf your way into revealing all of your meeples accidentally. Something a little bit thicker might've done a better job, but things cost money. Fun. The game reaches a really nice climax. The stakes get higher and higher as the game goes on. And I know a lot of games do that by you know, increasing the number of points you can get and things. But in the second round of this game, Summer, the tiles that come out are way better than the spring tiles. And then the tiles that come in fall after that are uh, super great. And you wonder why you ever spent meeples on those crummy tiles in the springtime. And then these boats that have been coming over and bringing more and more meeples that you're bidding on in order to increase your supply of currency, not only just sit there, but you're bidding to actually take them home and put them in your village somewhere. And a bunch of the end game tiles, the winter ones, are all about this really interesting spatial puzzle and how you've decided to lay out the tiles in your village. It just goes do 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 and it just gets more and more thrilling as you play. Not fun. Keyflower isn't really built as a memory game, but it is the kind of game where players who have better memory than other players could fare better. If you are able to Rain Man card count your way through the game and you, you see all the meeples and the only information you don't really have available to you is off the top who randomly got which colors of meeples, but you know how many meeples they have and you get to see the colors of the meeples they have as they play them through the game. So as you go on, if you're able to memorize that stuff, you've got perfect information about all the different meeples, barring those random meeple pulls from the bag. That's the only moment where you just have to guess. But it's a one in three chance, or potentially a one in four chance if there are green meeples in the bag. So if this really worries you, maybe you could solve it by agreeing that everybody is allowed to take notes if you want to take it that seriously, especially if you do have Rain Man at the table with you. It's a minor point though, I don't know if it's going to wreck your fun. Not fun! The theme is deadly boring. I appreciate the fact that the iconography is really clear and everything has a really clean, crisp look to it but it, it comes across to me as a little bit sterile. And what's weird to me is that all these Euro games that involve farming are really weirdly sterile. Like this game is about pilgrims, it's about settlers who are coming to this untamed land and they're you know, trying to brave the winter and, and chop down trees with hand tools and, and you know, build their houses and probably bears and wolves. It's kind of a task that's fraught with danger and excitement and drama, but none of these Euro games capture any of that. They're very, very stilted and plastic wrapped. So none of the excitement and drama that you would actually experience going through this time period actually reads in the game. And I haven't seen it read in any Euro game, so it's not just a flaw of Keyflower. Also, if you're sensitive to colonization, I'm not, but if you are, Keyflower is like a play on Mayflower, which is one of the boats that brought over the early American settlers. And then as you know, they 
took the lands that were there through a combination of force and superior technology, and writing treaties that they later reneged on. There are no actual interactions with indigenous people in the game, but if just the whole gist of that theme bugs you, you might want to try something different. So let's find the fun in Keef Flower, where fun is represented by Keef Richards. His drug addiction is amusing. And not fun is represented by Keef for Sutherland. His alcohol addiction is upsetting. The scales of fun have spoken. Keyflower is fun. <laughs> yes, Keyflower is fun, but like so many of these games, there's a bit of a qualifier. It's a certain type of fun for a certain type of brain. Keyflower, I think, is fun like a spreadsheet is fun. And if you say, Ryan, how's a spreadsheet fun? Then <laughs> this might not be the kind of game that you find fun. It's one of the rare games in my collection that I can finish playing, and after about three hours, I'll just say, set it up again, we're playing. I've introduced the game to many of my non-gamer friends, and I think they hate my guts for it, because that's kind of like throwing people into the deep end of a shark-infested pool. It's what we in the board game world call crunchy, meaning there are a lot of different decisions to make, and the decisions are really interesting and crucial and, and difficult. And in a lot of these games, you're playing based on what you think is going to happen, what kind of tiles are going to come up in the game, or what your options are that the game presents you with. But there's a reason why I play these games with people, and Keyflower really exploits that human aspect. Because what other people decide to do with their meeples in the game is a major, major part of the game. I also really like games where if I take the trouble to build it, I get benefit from it. You might have seen my Find the Fun video on Lost Ruins of Arnak. I really like that game, but one of the things I don't like about it is that if I go and spend all the resources and the figure to go explore a dig site, and I spend even more resources fighting off the Guardian who lands there, some gigantic bird lizard thing, then for the rest of the game, after that site's cleared out, other players can just, just visit that place. They don't have to spend all the compasses to get there, they don't have to spend the resources fighting off the Guardian. And I don't get anything. I don't get recognition for finding that dig site. Well, Keyflower, like certain other games, like Lords of Waterdeep, gives you credit for other people using the thing that you built, and I really like that. If somebody places meeples on the tiles in the village that you have worked hard to create, you get to keep those meeples for the next round. That's cool. Off the top of this, I listed a whole pile of mechanics that Keyflower has. It's an auction game. It's a worker placement game. It's a tile laying game. It's a city building game. And since the game was released, board games have kind of gone in a predictable direction where designers say, oh, you know, this game was popular and its mechanic is neat, and, and this game was popular and it's got a cool mechanic, so what if we just take those two mechanics and just jam their faces together and make them kiss? Sometimes that works. I'm finding often it doesn't. I want to assure you that Keyflower isn't that kind of game. Nobody made anybody kiss in this game. It is really tightly and interestingly and intricately designed, and the systems work together. Nothing's stapled together or plastered over with duct tape. It works, it gels, it flows. And just from a game design perspective, from the point of view of a game designer, it's a beautiful thing. It's dry, don't get me wrong. I mean, it could use a few more zombie hookers in it. But if you want to play a game that has some great systems that are really tightly enmeshed in a really brilliant way that makes you feel smart for playing it and gives you lots of different paths to victory, the Keyflower is an excellent, excellent game. I hope you've had a chance to play it, and if you haven't, seek it out at your local board game cafe once you're vaccinated, or pick up a copy from your friendly local game store. As long as I'm telling you to do stuff, please also click these three very important buttons. One looks like a thumb, one says subscribe, and one is like a little alarm bell. That'll tell you when I've got new content like this for you to enjoy. And if you really enjoy it, you can place one of your green meeples, a flat one that is more in the shape of a dollar bill, on my Patreon page and help keep this channel running. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll catch you in the next one. Did you just watch that whole thing? Oh, hey! To 100% this video, click the badge to subscribe, and then click the bell to get notifications when I've got new stuff.